Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, today is November 3rd, and I can honestly say that this is, you know, the craziest semester I think I've ever, uh, I've ever taught in. Um, I, we've had a, a more than one hurricane break now. We have a pandemic. We have all kinds of interesting stuff going on. But the fact that we are continuing to move forward is a testament to the fact that we take this seriously, right? Uh, and so this is just another bump in the road. We're going to be fine. And it's worth pointing out that uh, these are also the very best students. You're all the very best students I've ever had. So it doesn't surprise me at all that we're going to be fine. I hope everybody made it through Zeta okay. Uh, you know, I know that we all had power losses and things like that, but I hope uh, nothing more serious. And let's just keep powering through. Uh, I want to remind everybody that we're doing module five right now. And uh, I also have the exams. And so those of you that are not uh, in class today, I can't pass your test back, but you can check that online. Uh, and of course, as always, if you have any questions, any concerns at all, just get in touch with me. Uh, and there we go. I also want to remind everybody that we are now advising pre-registration is opening up, right? So it's time for you to pick your classes for the spring semester. You have an advisor. You can find your advisor in web services. But of course, if you have any questions about that, get in touch with me that way too, and I can help you sort that out. But my advice, of course, is get your classes early, okay? Get advised and get registered as early as possible. That way everything will be, uh, all the classes will be open that you want. And we absolutely want everyone back here in the spring. They are doing um, advisement in the commons this week. I don't know if y'all know that, but uh, during the regular day in the commons, all you have to do is go there and you can, you can get advised and that way you can get registered and get it all taken care of. Okay, well, when we left off, I believe we were talking about the scientific revolution, right? And how uh, a number of very impressive advancements took place during the 19th century that actually started having a real impact on human life. So all of these years and decades of studying suddenly started to pay off, and, and we're real proud of that. What we can also see is that um, you know, during the mid-19th century, we really do start to see many of the trappings of modern life. Uh, we're starting to see urbanization take place on a large scale. We're starting to see transportation and communication uh, become somewhat modern. You know, we can now travel long distances in a, in a relatively short period of time. We can now communicate long distances. Telegraphs, for example, have now popped up. The modern world is, is really starting to emerge. Now, you will recall that we talked about Robert Owen, this industrialist who had made an awful lot of money, so he decided that he was going to create a model community, and he was going to create what we call uh, utopian socialism, where workers get paid more than they really should, and profits aren't all that important, and corporations decide that there, is, uh, uh, there are greater priorities than profits. But we also know that utopian socialism didn't work. Uh, it turned out to basically be a bust. And the reason is because if a company isn't looking at the bottom line, if making the most money is not what the company's top priority is, um, ultimately it's going to, it's going to fail. And, and, and you know, investors are not interested in paying the workers more, right? Investors are interested in making a profit. And if you uh, are not pushing every single opportunity to profit, uh, other companies will drive you out of business, that sort of thing. So utopian socialism sounds lovely. In practice, it just doesn't really work. And Robert Owen's other attempts to create these types of communities, specifically in Indiana, uh, it, it turned out to not work. It turned out to fail. Well, we're going to talk about another socialism today. We're going to talk about a different version, and this is the version that is going to be significantly more influential. What we're going to talk about today is Marxist socialism, or otherwise known as Marxism. And this is a political, economic, and social philosophy that will have an impact all the way up to the present day. It is still something that a lot of people support, and it's going to completely reshape the 20th century. It will be sort of the defining social issue of the 20th century, as one part of the world 
embraces it, but the other part of the world opposes it very aggressively. And of course, we were in that second category. So, you will recall that in 1848, there were riots and attempted revolutions all across Western and Central Europe. There was, you know, in France, they overthrew Louis Philippe. In Germany, they had a whole range of riots in German cities. The Austrian Empire almost collapsed and Franz Joseph came to the throne. We talked about that. Well, it was very obvious as a result of these revolutions that industrial workers now have a large enough number to have a very real impact on political events. That this new working class of people who live in cities and go to work in various factories, they're going to express themselves. And this is a new type of citizen. These are not peasants. These are not you know, sort of the upper middle class. A lot of them are largely illiterate. And a man is going to emerge named Karl Marx, and he will have a, uh, a partner, Frederick Engels. Engels is kind of the Garfunkel of the two, so people don't talk about him very much. They tend to just focus on Marx. And he is very, very interested in what kind of role this new industrial working class is going to play in the future. Because one thing is certain, we're going to see a lot more of these people moving forward. Industry is growing by leaps and bounds. It's going to continue to grow. The next generations are going to involve a lot more industrial workers. And Karl Marx is kind of puzzled. Now, follow me on this one. There's a few interesting phenomenons that he notices. We are generating enormous amounts of wealth as a result of industry. You know, industry has been around for well over 50 years by this point. And the more industry emerges, the more money is made. And the more potential for major improvements in how humans live are there. And it's obvious for anyone to see. But when you look at how the average person lives, in Marx's case, we would say Europe, but in the Western world, honestly, it doesn't appear that this wealth is being spread around. It doesn't appear that these industrial workers are any better off than the peasants were in earlier generations. It seems like the masses of poor people who have very difficult lives well, they're still around, and it doesn't seem to matter how much money we generate or how much economic growth happens. Life for the average person, eh, I'm not so sure it's very good, and Marx observes this. As a matter of fact, a strong argument could be made that these urban industrial workers have it far worse than their ancestors did back when they were peasants in the countryside. You know, when you're an industrial worker in the 19th century, you work very long hours in very difficult conditions. And you're still scrapping and scraping for the next meal. So what's going on here? You know, how come we can't have a more prosperous society? What's happening? And so Marx is really interested in this. And so he studies it and he studies it and he studies it. And he looks at all different aspects of society. Who has money? Who is making money? He looks at the geography of this. You know, where is the where is the industry being built? Where is it not being built? And he and Engels, and again, I'm just saying Marx, but I do want to emphasize that Engels was a part of this too, comes to the conclusion that society, human civilization, always seems to break itself down into classes. It doesn't matter where you go, any time, any place, pick an era, pick a culture, and it always seems like there is a small little group of very wealthy people at the top, and then the masses of ordinary people that seem to do all of the work. Now again, pick anywhere, anytime, and that's what we see. 
go to, uh, I don't know, ancient Egypt, right? And there was a small little group of nobility and all those peasants working the banks of the Nile. Go to ancient Rome, right? There were the patrician classes, that 1% of very wealthy men that walked around in their togas and seemed to have all the money in the world. And then there's all those plebeians doing all of the work. If you go over to Asia, ancient China, ancient Japan, they had their nobility and all of the people that did the work. Mesoamerica, you know, the Maya and the Aztec and the Inca. I don't know that Marx looked at them directly, but, you know, he would point it out very, you know, very clearly. The Inca Empire had a small little group of elite nobility, right? And then all the other people are doing all of the work in those very hard conditions in the Andes, you know, the terraced agriculture, long, long hours every day. It's just always that way. Look at feudal Europe. You know, during the Middle Ages, we had the small little group of knights and noblemen, right? And they owned all of the land. And everybody else was just a serf doing the work. And so Marx is wondering, how is it that human civilizations always create this pattern? You know, cultures that have never been connected to each other still did exactly the same thing. He's fascinated by it. You know, is this an inherent part of who we are? Is this just something that comes with civilization? Or maybe there's something else. And I don't need to tell you that Marx doesn't like it. He doesn't think it's fair. He thinks it's wrong that a tiny little group of people seem to have all of the wealth and then a mass of people, 90 plus percent of the population seems to work from cradle to grave, from dawn to dusk, never living a better life. And it appears that even with industry and all of this industrial growth and all of this economic growth and all of this potential for so much more wealth and prosperity, it seems like exactly the same thing is happening again. With all of these industrial workers slaving away at these machines, but they don't really seem to see any of the money that their work is generating. I mean, something's wrong here. Marx was a philosopher, which meant that he was actually pretty lazy. <laughs> um, but yes, he was well off. You know, he 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 rose his way up and was uh, was himself quite comfortable. And he was not an industrial worker, as I understand. Philosophers tend to be lazy. I don't know if y'all know that, but like every single philosopher from Confucius to Socrates to you know, Marx and Nietzsche and all of them, they're all, they're all pretty lazy. It's a joke among the philosophy people, just in case you're wondering. But no, Marx was not poor, no. I was thinking because, like, you were, like, noticing that, you know, like, how the uh, working class doesn't make as much or whatever, because I was kind of thinking that maybe he was part of it. Yeah, yeah, I, I would think so. And we would have to look into his background a little bit more, uh, a little bit more closely. But he was Jewish. I mean, his, his name is Marx. He, he, you know, he had a Jewish background, so it was... Uh, anyway... Anyway, so what's going on here? Marx is trying to figure out what makes this happen. And, and what he really wants to know is, can we, can we get past this? Can we stop this? Can we create a society where that's not the case? Can we create a society where everybody shares in the wealth in a fair way? And we don't have this elite group of people that have all the money and then all of the workers who seem to be dead broke. Well, in 1848... Not coincidentally, the same year that these riots and industrial uprisings are taking place across Europe, Marx and Engels publish the Communist Manifesto, which is their solution and their explanation of what's going on. Now, the Communist Manifesto is, I mean, it's a stretch to call it a book. It's almost a pamphlet. It isn't long at all. You could read it within 30 minutes and probably still have time to spare. So what does he say in the Communist Manifesto, and what is his blueprint to a society that doesn't work this way? And I will tell you this, the Communist Manifesto is groundbreaking in the sense that nobody had written this before, and to this day, it has had more of an impact than just about any other modern book on social or economic philosophy. And I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying this book has had an impact on how people think more than just about anything else that, that has been written. So, first of all, Marx and Engels, again, I'm just going to say Marx, 
discuss what we just discussed, that every society seems to create this upper class and these workers. Every society throughout history. It has always happened. And he refers to it as a class struggle because these two groups are struggling against each other. The workers are not interested in being poor peasants and serfs and schmucks. And the 1% that own everything are aggressively going to do everything possible to hold their power. And so there is a struggle going on. No matter how peaceful and orderly the society may appear, you better believe underneath the scenes, those two sides are going against each other. Marx argues that the elites, the 1%, and we'll give them a name here in a minute, also are going to become the political leaders. It isn't a coincidence that the wealthy, powerful people are also the people making the laws. And of course, they make laws to keep themselves in power. You know, think of feudal Europe, right? You know, the feudal lords were the ones making the law. Big surprise, they gave themselves all the power and all the privilege. Look at the old regime in France, right? The, that wealthy elite were the ones in charge. Big surprise, they gave themselves all kinds of privileges, including not having to pay taxes, right? When I'm the boss, I take care of me. That's just the way it is. And so that, that 1%... Rule society. He will call the 1%, and it's a term we've already addressed, the bourgeoisie. Oops, sorry, now I spelled it. He will call them the bourgeoisie. And he says that this is the new 1%. This is the 1% that were created by the Industrial Revolution. Industry has created a whole new class of millionaires, so to speak. You know, if you are a factory owner, if you are an early investor in the Industrial Revolution, you are now wealthy and powerful, and you are in this class. They are the bourgeoisie, the factory owners. The workers, he calls the proletariat. The workers are the proletariat. The 90 plus percent of everybody that shows up working those long hours and getting paid very little for their trouble. Now here's the linchpin of it. Here's the most important fact that Marx wants you to understand. Why is it that that little 1% of bourgeoisie always finds themselves in charge? How is it that every society always works out this way? Well, there's one key to it, a linchpin that holds this exploitive system in place. And when you start looking around, you realize, oh yeah, this is what it is. Private property ownership. Private property ownership makes it all possible. Now, we're not talking private property ownership as in your personal effects. You know, your hat and your shoes and your pencil and your backpack. That's your private property. Marx isn't referring to that. Personal effects are not an issue. When Marx talks about private property ownership, He's talking about the means of production, the way wealth is generated. Throughout most of history, that meant land, right? During the feudal era in Europe, for example, it was land that gave those feudal lords so much wealth, right? And the more land you owned, the more money you made. So the private ownership of that land puts you in the 1%. If we go back to other ancient societies, it was basically the same way. I talk about ancient Greece in my World Civ I class and how at one point in Athens there was tremendous poverty and tremendous hunger and they hired a man named Solon to come in and try to figure out why the Athenian people are suffering so much. And Solon said the problem is that too few people own all the land. And when all of the land is owned by a small group of people, everyone who doesn't own land goes hungry. 
And if you look again, going back to feudal Europe, you had these feudal lords that owned huge amounts of land, you know, as far as the eye can see. And I am, you know, this, this high ranking nobleman and all of that land. I mean, it's more than I could ever possibly farm myself. And I'm not the one farming it anyway. My serfs are the ones farming. So what about the modern era with industry? Well, it's the ownership of the industry. The owner of the factory gets so rich because he owns the factory. So he gets all the profits. He gets all the benefit. The workers don't own the factory, so the workers can't enjoy the real money that that factory generates. And big surprise, the more money I make, the more factories I can go out and buy, right? And so the wealth ends up being concentrated. I start by owning one factory. And then I make enough money, so I go out and buy another. Then I go out and buy another. And before you know it, I own a whole bunch of factories. I have a pile of money bigger than a house, and it's all coming to me because it's all mine. And Mark says that's the problem. It's the private property ownership. Draw a little diagram. I'll erase this. I'll put it another way. You have to help me out here. We're going to draw a factory. And I am a terrible artist and I don't care. We'll have our factory. We've got our door here. Let's put in a couple of little windows, right? I mean, you know, I don't want to be too cruel to my work. Windows cost money to put in, so I'm not going to put in too many. I mean, those workers don't need to see outside to work those machines. Okay, so we got our factory. Now, honest to goodness, does it matter what our factory makes? I mean, if you're an industrialist making money, you don't give a flip what your factory makes as long as it makes it and it makes you money, right? I mean, you'll invest in anything if somebody out there will buy it. So our factory makes widgets. I don't care, right? Now, how many employees are we going to have in our factory? Give us a nice round number. How about we have 100? How about we do 100, right? Keep it nice and metric. So we have 100. We have 100 workers. And let's, let's draw our workers. We've got dad. Yeah. And then, of course, we've got to have mom, too. Remember, mom works in the factory. And, of course, who else works in the factory? Oh, got to have the kids in the factory. Yeah, they're not happy either. Now, why are they all frowning? Why are they all sad? Yeah, I'm working in a factory in the 19th century, right? You're working in a factory in the 1800s, you're going to have a frown on your face. Long hours, it's dangerous. It's, you know, these kids, they belong in school, but of course they can't go to school. We got to make money. Life's hard for these workers. No matter how hard they work, nothing seems to get any better. They never can make their way into just, I mean, the factory seems to understand exactly how much it can pay them to keep them alive. And that's the most they ever seem to get paid. They never catch a break. It's a hard knock life. But of course, that's not the only person involved in the factory. We got to put me too. I'm the owner, right? So we're going to draw me. Yeah. There's one of me. And I am smiling. I'm doing good. As a matter of fact, I'm going to give myself a gold tooth. How about that? Maybe give myself a cane, and we'll gold plate that, right? And a chain. Oh, we've got to have the chain, absolutely. We've got to have the chain. <laughs> Dollar sign on the chain. Make it rain a little here. I'm sorry, what's that? I wasn't an artist? Oh, I'm not. I'm well, okay, All right. maybe I'm a little bit of an artist. Right? Yeah, oh, I'm doing good. Life is, life is, 
Life is on my side, I gotta tell you. I gotta tell you. Now, why am I smiling so much? I got the money, people. I got the money. Now, why is this the case? We've got 100 people who were slaving away in the factory making terrible wages, and then we got the one me. You know, I'm, I'm, old, I'm old Daddy Warbucks here. And here's where it gets even more ridiculous. I'm not even working in the factory. I might not even live near the factory. I might be, a, be an absentee owner. I don't go to the factory. I don't have anything to do with it. But for some reason, I'm the one that makes all the money from it. Let's do a little math. Let's have a little fun. Let's say my factory makes $1 million. And again, he was... Not, he wouldn't have used American money, but who cares? Money's money, whatever country, you know, pick a, pick a money, you'll take it, right? And let's say I give my factory workers 100,000. But of course, if I have 100 workers, that means they each get a thousand bucks, right? They split that among themselves. So each of my factory workers can get a thousand dollars, which is just enough to keep them from starving. Just enough to keep them coming back for more. You see, one of the problems you've got as a factory owner is if you pay your workers too much, they don't work for you anymore, do they? If you give them enough to invest, if you give them enough to build their own wealth, then you don't have workers anymore. So you can never pay the workers enough to break free. You can never pay them enough to be able to walk away. You gotta keep them hungry enough to have to keep coming back. But of course, if my factory made a million dollars and I gave 100,000 to them, how much does that leave for me? For me. Something seems a little off here, folks. One person who doesn't even show up, who doesn't even go to his factory, who lives far away, is making all the money and these poor people who show up every day and go through all the trouble are making chicken feed. Now, how come anyone would consider this fair? Marx would say, how could anybody you know, with a straight face say that this is a system that is in some way just? Now, why do I get to do this? Why do I get to keep all the money for myself? Because it's my factory. I own it. It's not your factory, y'all are the workers. I own the factory, which means I get the money. You get where I'm coming from? You understand why private property ownership is the problem, according to Marx. Now, what would a fair factory look like? Well, first of all, the fair factory wouldn't have this guy at all. I don't belong in the picture. I'm not even working there, right? If we had a fair factory, the proletariat would own it. The people that are actually doing the work should also get to be the ones that own the factory. Are you following me? And if my factory makes $1 million, the 100 people that work there should get to divide that profit up among themselves. You see where I'm coming from? Now, there's a few misunderstandings of Marx that we should clear up. Marx would not argue that every worker should make exactly the same amount of money. Marx would understand that the manager is going to make more money than the floor worker, right? The guy who's been there 20 years is going to make more money than the guy that just started. That being said, what matters is that what the factory makes goes to the people that are actually doing the work. You see what I mean? The people doing the work divide the wealth among themselves based on the work that they do. You work harder, you get more. You work less, you get less. I don't work at all. I'm daddy more bucks. I get zero. You see where I'm coming from. The people owning the factory are the people that get the money and are, are doing the work. Marx would say that during the feudal era, if all of the serfs owned the land, they would have immediately lived a better life. They would have immediately been able to get the wealth from their land instead of giving it to some knight who's going to build a big castle on the hill and pretend he's more important than them. 
Marx looked over at the United States and he was extremely critical, not surprisingly, of slavery. And he said slavery is the natural extension. Remember, this is 1848. We still have slavery in the United States. Slavery is the natural extension of this exploitive capitalist system. And what these Americans have done is taken it to the extreme. We're not going to pay our workers at all. We're going to pay them zero. Their pay is basically their food and shelter, and we're going to own them as property just like we own the factory as property. Now, how in the world could you possibly consider that moral or just? You know, this, this exploitive system has been taken so far that these, these men are claiming to own the workers themselves. And that's just absurd. But that's what ends up happening. Now, of course, the system that we're talking about here is called capitalism. And we've talked about capitalism already, haven't we? So Marx says the new system that we should use is socialism. Now, this is not the Robert Owen, let's all be kind to each other socialism. Marx says the only way this is going to work is through a revolution. And he says the workers need to rise up, throw off the ownership, and take over themselves. We need to have a revolution where the factory work is going to be, uh, the factory workers are going to be the ones that own the factories. Now, Marx will say that not only should this happen, but this is inevitable. He says, this is absolutely inevitable. These people are not going to work for slave wages permanently and sit back and just deal with it. Sooner or later, they're going to realize the raw deal they're getting, and they're going to rise up and do it. So Marx says that the revolutions of 1848 are just an extension of that. The revolutions of 1848 were the workers rising up and demanding better treatment, rising up and demanding better pay, rising up and demanding that they no longer be exploited. And he said, this is going to happen again and again, and sooner or later, the workers are going to win. We will create a system that doesn't have a bourgeoisie, that doesn't have a proletariat. It is a system without social or economic classes, and everybody gets to benefit from the work they do. Marxism is going to spread very quickly. And by the 1860s and 1870s, the Communist Manifesto is a huge seller across Europe. It's particularly popular in Germany, also in England. And Marxists are going to start becoming active in politics. They're going to start organizing worker groups, demanding an overthrow of the capitalist system and an establishment of a socialist framework. Now, the existing political and economic order is going to do everything it can to stop socialism. And socialism is going to be public enemy number one of the people that own the factories. Now, I want you to think about this for a second, right? Remember, factories aren't necessarily owned by one rich daddy Warbucks. Frequently, factories are owned by investors, aren't they? You can buy stock in a factory and own a little piece of it yourself. So if you are an ordinary person and you're not rich, but you're doing better than most, you're going to look at socialism and say, hold on a minute, they're trying to take away something that I've invested in. Are you following me? What's the flip side of what Marx says if we look at it from that perspective? When the people show up and say, hold on a second, Karl Marx, I'm not so sure that you're looking at everything. What's the argument that maybe this Marxist ideology isn't what he's making it out to be? Can anybody think of a problem with it? And I just gave you that hint. Well, one criticism is that the dichotomy between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat is often a lot more murky. Not everybody who falls into the bourgeoisie is rich. Not every investor and owner in a factory is living in a mansion on a hill. A lot of people that work in the factories turn around and invest in factories. Not everybody is poor. You see what I'm saying? And it's one thing to say, I think workers should get more money. Sure, we could agree to that. I think workers should have safer conditions. I think workers should have the opportunity for a better life. And it's an entirely 
different ball game when you say they should overthrow the entire ability to own a factory and take over themselves and nobody can get rich because nobody can invest in anything. You get where I'm coming from? And so a lot of people are criticizing Marx by saying that there's actually a big gray area between the rich and the poor. There's an awful lot of people that fall in between. How about this? Is it possible to start off down here and then suddenly work your way to the top through good judgment and hard work and, and talent and ability? Well, sure, right? Criticisms of Marx are going to say, well, yeah, a lot of people are born rich, but the truth is Daddy Warbucks might have started off poor. Daddy Warbucks might have worked his way up. It's certainly possible. You know, what is it, and, and we'll use a 2020 statistic, something like 80% of all millionaires were not born wealthy at all, right? They powered through it and made it happen. And so what Marx is doing is taking away the ability for people to invest their wealth and actually improve themselves through their own efforts. And so Marx is, is creating this one or the other when in fact there's an awful lot of gray area there. How about this? What am I holding up right here? Cell phone. Can anybody say what it is? Busted screen, of course. It's an iPhone. I own an iPhone. Got the iPad here, right? Who makes iPhones and iPads? Apple. Goes without saying that Apple is a successful company, right? Apple's done pretty well over the years. You better believe it, right? Apple's had its ups and downs. But certainly in the past 20 years in your lifetime, Apple has been easily one of the most successful companies ever to exist. Now, why does Apple make iPhones? Why do they make iMacs? Why do they make iPads? Why do they make that stuff? Because, well, yeah, they figured out people want them. So what's Apple really in the business of doing? How about making money, right? Apple is in the business of making money. That's what a company does. Now, does Apple make the world a better place as a result? Well, I like my iPhone. I like my iPad, right? Computers are fantastic, right? Apple has pioneered that. But the truth of the matter is, Apple makes a better iPhone every year. Apple improves their computers every year. Apple is efficient. Apple is industrious. Apple pushes forward with a tremendous amount of progress that ultimately helps all of us out because of that quest to make money, that quest to become wealthy. And the investors in Apple are willing to put their money and take that risk because they know that Apple is going to try to drive forward. If there is no more profit motive, if there is no more motive to make as much money as possible, if you can never become Daddy Warbucks, no matter how hard you try because the system doesn't let you, where's the progress going to come from? Right? Where's the, where's the advancement? Where's the efficiency? Socialism has been tried before. You know, socialism, you know, since Marx published this, you know, we're going on about 170 years. Like I said, it's going to shape the 20th century in a lot of ways. And it just so happens that every time socialism takes over a society, the quality of life kind of goes down for everybody. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. And, and, and I'm, yeah, we're, we're, we're kind of a little bit off topic, but I don't mind bringing it up, okay? Well, you know, Marx would say that the elite universities, what we would call Ivy League universities, are an extension of the capitalist system, right? And the reason is because you have to be special to go there, right? You know, you ultimately, something like 50% of all Ivy League students uh, had parents who donated money to the school, right? And, and also had parents who were legacies themselves or who, you know, who went there themselves. So if your mom didn't go to Yale, you're not going to Yale, you know, that kind of thing, right? No matter how talented you may be. Marx would say that this whole idea of elite universities is an expression of capitalism, right? It's a way in which the wealthy elites keep themselves wealthy elites, right? We've all decided, we'll say Yale, we've all decided that Yale is the best school out there and you have to go to Yale in order to get the top job, and only a select few people get to go to Yale, and it just so happens that they're the very same people whose parents went to Yale before, right? It's perpetuating this 1%, right? It's kind of like nobility, right? Um, and in the modern era, you got to understand that, that these elite schools only start admitting poor people in the last generation or so, right? Up until very relatively recently, even in my lifetime, they didn't admit lower class people at all. 
right? They're doing that as a, as a charity to try to make themselves not look so elitist, right? I'm not, I'll just let you know right now. I'll, uh, since you brought it up, I mean, we're not talking about Marxism so much, but it's kind of related. You can kind of see how the relation is there, right? Um, I do not like the aggressive move to try to rank colleges and universities, and then you have to get into the school with the highest rank. Right now, I say that you might not know this, but we are a very highly ranked college. Uh, Mississippi Gulf Coast Community College is consistently one of the top 100 out of 1,200 in just about every program we have. And just a few years ago, we were evaluated by the Aspen Institute, and we were ranked as the number 10 community college in the entire country, and that's out of 1,200. Okay, and if you look at the Mississippi Community College system, we have several others that are right up there too. I mean, we are a very, very good community college. I don't, again, y'all might not have noticed that. And then we, we work at it. We want those rankings. You know, we want to be, you know, we invite everybody in, look at us as much as possible because we know how good we are. But that notwithstanding, um, I can assure you of this. Okay. I can promise you your success is not going to be based on which school you went to. It's going to be based on what you did with the degree that you got. Okay, you can pick any college, any university, and there are people that graduated there that are millionaires. Right? There are people that graduated from every school that are doing very, very well in life. The old saying, the cream always rises to the top. And so your decision to go to a community college and not say, I'm going to go hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt to try to power my way into one of those elite schools. You're saying, no, I'm going to go to community college first is really, really smart because you're saving a lot of money. And you're going to have all of the opportunity that someone would have going to a school that, uh, you know, people brag about. The truth of the matter is, I know enough about those schools. You're not getting a better education at, at, at that. It's all just sort of perpetuating this idea. And it, it is troubling. Like if, if we look at, for example, the U.S. Supreme Court, every single member of the U.S. Supreme Court either went to Harvard or Yale Law School. Every single one of them, right? Now, are you telling me that we don't have talented judicial minds that come from other colleges and universities? Are you implying that those are the only two schools where a good, you know, brain for a, for, for a judge can, I mean, again, it's, it's kind of troubling. But your decision to say, you know what, I don't care what school I go to, I care about what I do when I get there, that's smart. Smart move, real smart move. And uh, this constant competition to get into the best school, we need to get rid of it. Marx would agree. Marx would say, we need to get rid of that idea, right? We have an Apollo astronaut. Mississippi Gulf Coast Community College, Fred Hayes, went to the moon, Apollo 13, right? And he graduated right up there at Perth. You, he had the right stuff, right? Anybody can, anybody can succeed in life. You don't have to go to an elite school in order to do that. Who are the people that want anything? I'm sorry, who are the people that work as hard as possible to make it important that you go to the elite school? Who are the people that push that as much as possible? How about the people that run the elite schools, right? You know, if you go talk to the people at those schools, like, oh, you need to go here in order to have a, you know, it's like, no, you don't. No, you don't. It's all a scam. You'll do just fine going to Mississippi Gulf Coast Community College. I promise you that. And if anybody get, if anybody tells you otherwise, say, okay, we'll go talk to Fred Hayes. You know, Apollo 13 astronaut. He went to Perk. Okay, and I can assure you, he is, he is someone worthy of admiration. And there's plenty of other alumni as well, but he's just the one who comes to mind right now. Well, anyway, socialism, back to what I was saying before. Socialism was tried. Socialism was tried more than once. And every time socialism is implemented and factories are taken away from the private owners and are taken over by the workers of the state, every time we decide that we're going to get rid of this capitalist system where you can invest your money and become wealthy and, yes, end up becoming elite and better than other people financially, Every time we do that, uh, it seems to always create a society that's worse, not better. Everybody's quality of life seems to go down. Socialism has never created an affluent, prosperous society, no matter how many times it's been tried. At least Marxist socialism, Marxism. Factories that are run based on the system Marx talked about turn out junk. The workers don't show up for work on time. The workers don't work hard. There's very little innovation, very little research. There's no quest for profit, so why should I make my product any better, right? I'm not competing with the guy up the street, so why are any of us going to work that hard? 
It seems like everything kind of goes down. And every single time socialism, as Marx defined it, proves that it's a failure, somebody comes along and says, oh, well, don't worry, they'll do it right the next time, right? And it's like, how many times do we have to try this to realize that Marx just didn't quite have it right? He was on the right track in some ways. We can understand his concern for the workers. We can understand him pointing out how the system is exploitive, exploitative. But the pure Marxist society isn't going to work. Um, the German Marxist party, the SPD, would become a very powerful political party in Germany. And labor unions all across the world, the United States, Britain, France, Germany, you name it, labor unions are going to be led by leaders who consider themselves socialists, who argue that the capitalist system that enables private property ownership is a, is a walled garden that keeps out all of the ordinary people. When the civil rights movement emerges in the United States, civil rights leaders almost universally were socialists themselves. And so not only were they calling for an end to segregation and Jim Crow laws, but they were calling for effectively socialist revolution. Uh, a good example is uh, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, the founder of the NAACP, was openly, unapologetically socialist. Uh, a. Philip Randolph, y'all have heard of the March on Washington, right? I have a dream today, right? Martin Luther King was not openly socialist, but the man that organized that march was, was a fellow by the name of A. Philip Randolph, and he was. You know, he was openly socialist. And a big reason why so many people opposed the civil rights movement, as noble a movement as it was, was because a lot of people considered it a socialist movement as well. And that's uh, part, of, uh, part of it that we don't generally talk about. During the 20th century, the United States will emerge as the world's foremost anti-socialist nation. And we will consider socialism public enemy number one. And the Soviet Union, we're jumping ahead, but Russia will undergo a, Soviet, will undergo a socialist revolution at the end of World War I and create the USSR, the Soviet Union, a socialist nation. And they will embrace the most extreme form of socialism, which of course we simply call communism, which is when you take the economic aspects of what Marx is talking about and turn it into, turn it into a political system as well. And so communism and socialism are very similar. Generally speaking, when socialist societies emerge, we see an end to democracy because you see socialism cannot deliver the quality of life that the free market delivers. People who live in socialist societies don't have iPads. They don't have iPhones. They don't have cars that get better every year. They don't get to go to the grocery store and see a gazillion different products that they can buy. And every year it seems like they get cheaper and cheaper. And so what happens is if you have democracy and socialism at the same time, the people vote out socialism. And so socialist leaders tend to turn into dictators. And any time you see a socialist leader take over, you can check the clock and say, okay, how long is it going to be before they start shutting down things like free speech and free press? Because they can't allow people to criticize them or else socialism may get overturned. A socialist leader took over in Venezuela in 1998 named Hugo Chavez. And within 10 years, he had shut down all opposition political parties. He had shut down newspapers that didn't like him. He began to take over the Venezuelan oil industry, which caused oil production to plummet. The Venezuelan economy just, you know, completely tanked, and now Venezuela is almost a failed state because of these socialist policies that Hugo Chavez put in place. And he's dead now, but his successor, Nicolas Maduro, is doing the same thing. Now, who are the people that socialism is going to appeal to? Who are the people that are going to look at socialism and say, yeah, this is good? How about the lower class? Did you say the lower class? Yeah, yeah, the workers, right? The workers look at this and say, oh, yeah, you know, we need to take over the factory and own it ourselves. Obviously, it's the investors, the people that own the factories, the people that have a vested interest in owning private property that are going to not like socialism. And so this is going to end up becoming an issue when we start to see voting because there's going to be a tremendous fear that if we allow the industrial workers to vote, they will vote in socialist leaders. You know, these are sort of secretly socialist people. And so that's also going to become a big issue and why the fight over who gets to vote 
suddenly becomes such a big deal. So what I want you to understand, what I want you to understand about this is that this is still a very active movement around the world. And you have to kind of decide how much of this you agree with and how much of it you don't. There's no exact right answer. Pure socialism almost always creates a failed state. But of course, pure capitalism that doesn't care about the workers and doesn't care about anything but making money also creates a very exploitative state, right? And so we have to try to find a way to say, okay, let's take care of workers and let's give them the ability to move up in life and do well, but at the same time, protect people's ability to own private property and invest in, and that's a tough one. That's a tough one. And let's move on to the next topic, which is tied to it. And that is imperialism. And that is imperialism. And the spread of colonial rule. Imperialism and the spread of colonial rule. The industrial world and the industrial growth that took place during the 19th century will ultimately require raw materials to power all of those factories, but also markets for all of the goods that those factories create. If you're a factory owner and you sell uh, widgets, your goal is to sell as many as possible, right? And every year you wanna sell more and more and more. And one of the interesting characteristics of capitalism, and again, that's the system we have in the United States, where, you know, which we've been talking about. One of the interesting characteristics of capitalism is that in order for it to be healthy, it kind of always has to be growing. A private company never really lasts unless it is in a constant state of growth and expansion. Who in here has heard of Ray Kroc? Anyone know who he is? Oh, you've most definitely been influenced by him. Who is he? Yeah, he's the McDonald's man. He's the McDonald's man. What happened is Ray Kroc was a milkshake salesman, milkshake machine salesman. And he came across this fast food restaurant in California. Um, and it was, it was, a, it used the fast food model. And but it was only one restaurant. That was it. I mean, there were, maybe there were like two or three of them, but it was a very small little operation. And he immediately looked at this and said, I can take this nationally, this idea, this model for fast food. And so he bought out the McDonald's brothers. And, and, and so he's sort of the founder of McDonald's. And of course, within 10 or 15 years of him buying it out, there was a McDonald's everywhere, right? Y'all know McDonald's is kind of everywhere. And Ray Kroc's logic was, if your business isn't growing, it's dying. It's either one of the two. Your business either keeps growing or your business starts to die. There's no, there's no middle ground. And so if you want to know why McDonald's is constantly expanding, you know, why McDonald's never quits growing, why they're constantly building more and more and more and more of them, goodness knows we don't need any more McDonald's, do we? But for some reason, they keep building more it's because of that philosophy that he started with. A company must continue to grow or it will fail. That's it. Yes. Ah, oh, forget about the quizzes. Thank you. Well, what's going to happen? And, and I'll pass those out. See, I told you I'd forget. What's going to happen, of course, is that they figured this out a lot earlier than McDonald's. And so the nations that have embraced industry are going to start expanding into the world and conquering new territories so they continue to so they can continue to grow their economies. And they're going to start conquering Asia, Africa, other parts of the world so they can have more markets, more people to buy their goods, and of course the raw materials for them. We'll get into that on Thursday, I suppose. Okay, I'll go ahead and stop the uh, recording now. Look, here's the deal, folks. Um, if you want to see your test and you're not here today, you'll need to get in touch with me. I'll figure out a way to get it to you. Um, and if you have any questions, just uh, let me know. Take care.